Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Arthur Goldhammer, uh, along with my co-chairs, Professor Laura Freider of Northeastern University, Professors Julian Borg and Jim Cronin from uh, Boston College. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this special edition of uh, the Contemporary European Poly Politics Seminar. Uh, today's session is going to be devoted to the presidency of Emmanuel Macron in France in the upcoming 2022 ele uh, elections. This uh, special event is the brainchild of uh, Marc-Olivier Behaer, who is a journalist at Le Monde and who will be the master of ceremonies uh, for today's session. Uh, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A function to pose questions throughout the session. Uh, I will relay them to the panelists uh, after they finish speaking. Our format today will be uh, presentations of about 10 minutes from uh, each uh, of the scheduled panelists, and then we'll begin the Q&A session with uh, Marc Olivier leading it off. Uh, I'm now going to turn the uh, mic over to uh, Marc Olivier Berger, who will present our panelists for uh, this afternoon. Marc Olivier? Yes, thank you, uh, Arthur. Um, uh Thank you, uh, every, uh, everybody, to be uh, there. It's a very special event for me because I'm nearing the end of my fellowship here at the Neiman Foundation. It's been a very special year for me uh, being able to study uh, at Harvard. So I want to take just a moment to express my gratitude. And uh, but uh, let's move along. And now let me introduce you to our, uh, our wonderful guest. First, um, we have the pleasure to have among us Cécile Alduy, who is a professor in French literature and culture and director of graduate studies in French at Stanford University. She's also a research fellow at the CV Puff at Sciences Po Paris. She's a specialist of uh, political discourse analysis, especially far-right discourse. She's the author of What They Really Say, Politicians Taken at Their Own Words, and of uh, Marine Le Pen Taking to Her Words, Deciphering the New National Front uh, Discourse. She's a regular contributor to the, to the Atlantic, Political, The New York Times, Le Monde, L'Humanité, uh, Liberation, among others. Gérard Haro is a career diplomat and has retired in 2019 from the French Foreign Service as ambassador of France to the United States. Uh, throughout his career, he held numerous positions Director for Strategic Affairs, Security and Disarmament, Ambassador of uh, France to Israel, direct, Director General for Political Affairs and Security, and Representative of France to the UN. He has recently published his memoirs, Passport, Passport Diplomatique, sorry. He's a trustee of the uh, International Crisis Group and Senior Distinguished Fellow at, of the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. He's a columnist for the weekly Le Point and regularly contributes to news outlets, to different news outlets, sorry. And um, lastly, uh, Philippe Martin is a professor of uh, economics at Sciences Po Paris. And, Sciences, and since 2018, he's the chairman of the French Council of the Economics of Anna, uh, of the French Council of Economic Analysis, sorry, a board advising the Prime Minister on economics. He is the chair of the National Productivity Board and co-chair of the Franco-German Council of Economic Analysis. He is vice president and research fellow at Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Before teaching in, in France, he served as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He was economic advisor of Emmanuel Macron uh, when he was minister of, uh, for the economy. His research focuses on international trade and macroeconomics. And so we are here today as in a year, French people will go to the polls as a French, uh, as President Emmanuel Macron will seek re-election. For the moment, Marine Le Pen, the far right candidate, holds a small lead in the voting intentions for the first round. But in the second round, when all the other candidates are eliminated by the two first, Macron is ahead. His image, his image, image, sorry, uh, in the French public is often of a man aloof and distant, but he's also seen as a determined leader. France has been going through major tensions lately, lately between terrorism and the Yellow Vest movements, and more and more broadly of political disillusion. Macron has one year to restore a sense of hope in France. If the pandemic clears away, it will have the, the opportunity to implement policies to restart France's economy. To discuss the challenges uh, uh, Macron faces, our distinguished guests will do a short presentation of 10 minutes, then we will have a more general uh, discussion. 
and uh, finish with a question and answer from the chairs and the public. I will ask uh, Professor Alduy to go first, and then Professor Martin, and lastly, uh, Ambassador uh, Aro. So if you, uh, uh, I will now ask uh, Professor Alduy to, to make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marc Olivier. Thank you, Art, for inviting me, and thank you for all the organizers of this exceptional event. Uh, since I have only 10 minutes to cover so much ground, I will go ahead. Um, so, you know, four years into his presidency and just one year before the next presidential cycle, it's natural to examine the actions of a sitting president. But I want to take this exercise from a slightly different angle and look not as much at uh, what Emmanuel Macron has accomplished or failed to accomplish, but at how he did it. So not, not as much as uh, what he did and did not do, but what models of action and agency he has used. So I will turn my attention, not just to the actions themselves, but to the acting. And maybe you can call it uh, a professional habit because I'm a literary scholar at first, but I'm inclined to think that we can draw interesting conclusions about the meaning of a macronism, but looking at the form of Macron's actions or to take his own vocabulary at his performance in the two word, a uh, twofold business and theatrical sense of the word. Uh, moreover, uh, and here I think more traditional political scientists would agree, how one leads is political in essence. The manner in which a president both performs, acts, decides, are in and of themselves political. They speak to his conception of power, of leadership, of democracy, and here are French history and memory. Further, in the next presidential campaign, Macron will be assessed by voters on his attitude and perceived traits of personality as a leader, as much as on his track record. So I think it's particularly appropriate to assess how Macron has performed as a president by looking at his rhetorical and acting performance, because what strikes me in his presidency and what singles him out compared to his predecessors is precisely the predominance of two models of acting that he has embraced. The first is the entrepreneur, an economic actor and a role for a specific kind of storytelling and management style. And we shall see that this model conveys its own value system implicitly. The second model, which he has established as a founding feature of his presidency during his inauguration at the Louvre on May 7th, uh, 2017, is that of theater staging, acting, narrating, tapping into mythology, mythologies, role-playing, have taken a center stage, to, so to speak, in his presidency. So I will look briefly at these two models, how they converge, because today the business world markets stories and identities as much as products, and to look at what they say about his worldview and what weaknesses or strengths can come from them. So first, Macron as a political entrepreneur. From the very beginning of his aspiration to higher office, he has branded himself as disruptive, taking a word from the business uh, world. And he has applied uh, the startup model to uh, the foundation of his movement En Marche. What I want to underline here is that he's adopted much more than the language of startups. He has literally used a business model to create his party and conquer shares of the political market from raising funds from venture capitalists to conducting a massive door-to-door -door survey of the political demand, uh, from using algorithm um, to analyze consumers' responses to questionnaires in 2016, and basically uh, working on a market analysis of the political space where he evaluated where he had um, a space to enter and conquer. This is the reverse of what traditional parties do. Usually they propose, they offer a, a, a coherent political offer based on pre-existing sets of values and ideals. Macron started from the political demands of the French and embraced that they might be contradictory. For instance, they want more protection and also more freedom. And that was a core tenet of, the, of his en même temps at the same time um, slogan. The question that has been left unanswered as long as possible throughout the last campaign, and that might still not be that clear, is what is the product and what is the content of the new brand? 
for the longest time, there was no platform but a project. C'est notre projet, he used to say, an empty word taken from the managerial world. Macron has created a movement, not a party, and maybe it's more a company than a movement, ruled by an overpowering CEO rather than under the democratic models of traditional political parties. En Marche, uh, at the very beginning, was more like a Yelp system or fan group than a politicizing organization. One could become a member by just clicking on a website and contribute Yelp notes or like Facebook, maybe the consumer becomes the content as much as the person buying something. But in the end, uh, Emmanuel Macron alone has remained the boss, the manager and the product. En Marche, the party, uh, mirrors the initials of the founding uh, person, Emmanuel Macron, conveying the idea that the brand is the man and the man is a brand. And so Macron has been very successful with this model of agency, which is the political entrepreneur. He has bulldozed his way through the left and right divide to impose a new model, the en même temps or at the same time um, model, which is a form of action uh, in the same way that his party is a movement, a direction, a dynamism rather than a content. And this is uh, this was, and maybe it will continue to be very appealing and it appeared at the time new, but I, I would contend that the appeal of it is its form, the fact that it was dynamic, um, pointing to a future, giving optimism, well, that clearly establishing would be what would be uh, the day-to-day -day consequences or the day-to-day -day platform. So the form of the movement, whether the content was a big part of uh, its appeal in 2017. There are a number of weaknesses that originate from this model. First, the market base of Macron to speak his language is far from being hegemonic today. Uh, his base, his core base is rather low, hovering around 23, 25% which is decent to go to the second round, but uh, he has not really gained much over the last four years. And only about 70% of his former electors are sure to continue to vote for him compared to 90% of uh, Marine Le Pen's electors who are determined to continue to vote for her. So there's no monopoly here uh, for this disruptive political startup. Another problem is that uh, because of the uh, structure of his electoral base, which is at the center, each time Macron goes on the right to concrete new shares of that political market, he loses shares on the left. So he's stable in numbers while he crosses the political divide back and forth. Another problem is that the model of leadership of, of this business model is actually very old school. He, governs at, at, at a Steve Jobs uh, rather than fostering uh, collaboration or the emergence of new leaders. En Marche as a political party is um, again, more than an empty shell. There's no um, regional or local rooting and a pretty huge weakness for the intermediary election that we're going to see uh, just in a month. And also Macron has been very good at destroying competitors, uh, the Socialist Party and uh, the Républicains, but he has no tooth as at attacking his main opponent, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, who is stronger as ever. And, and that's a bigger problem. Now, the second model I want to analyze is Macron as an actor. Uh, Hollande, François Hollande was criticized for never, never being able to inhabit the role of president. And Macron, uh, you know, proposed an image of himself as um, the counter model to that. He adopted the costume and what could say the crown of the president of the First Republic. Um, and then he put on many more costumes afterwards. There's a tremendous amount of energy and thinking that goes into staging, into symbols, telling stories, especially around heroism and leadership. Um, starting from the Louvre inauguration where he walked alone for three long minutes in the dark to arrive at the pyramids at the center of the French monarchy and François Mitterrand's heritage, all the way to um, the discourse where he stated that we were at war with the virus um, in, um, in April of 2020. Um, there is a tremendous amount of attention and care on polishing an image of himself, an image of leadership, 
and the story of France uh, reflecting this idea of um, uh, a manned up leadership. The, uh, the attention to performance, um, again, um, is new compared to Francois Hollande, but not that new in the overall scheme of things as it uh, taps into a collective imaginary around the monarchy, around Gaulism, and um, has resulted in a new change in the democratic life of the country. Um, intermediaries like the parliament, mayors, departments, or unions have been bypassed in favor of closed circles of advisors, including the recent uh, Defense Council. Uh, the uh, Convention Citoyenne sur le Climat has been a performance more than leading to real action. And the big debate that follows the Yellow Vests uh, movement uh, could have been a historical democratic moment and was hijacked by, again, the performance of Macron, uh, who found a lot of joy, apparently, uh, performing for seven hours in town hall meetings rather than having other leaders emerge from that movement. So I want to spend just one minute to, to draw from this some conclusions about the worldview that is proposed by Macron. Uh, first, there's a very strong belief in the shaping power of stories, language, and the collective imagination. So the I, I'm sorry, Professor Andrew, if sure. I could ask you to, to uh, finish. Uh, sure, I have just one more minute to go. Okay, sorry. So this, um, this, um, Interest in stories and staging, on the one heart, uh, on the one hand, could be uh, said to be going in the sense of uh, um, an attention to culture and the arts, but a more cynical way would go in um, different direction and insist on how it's leaning on uh, propaganda and the manipulation of the minds. Uh, the second aspect that I want to underline, and I promise I will finish, is that uh, the belief behind this is that one can embody different lives and characters, that one can become someone else. And there is, this is a core tenet of his philosophy of individual freedom and emancipation. However, a lot of people believe that they do not have, they cannot afford to live other lives because they're stuck in other kinds of social determinisms. And here again, I think that um, this project of Macron um, has not been able to offer a counter discourse to um, uh, the narrative of the National Front, for instance, which puts determinism, ethnic, religious, social determinism at its at the core of its political offer. And so we are left with two opposing political forces who have nothing in common to discuss or debate. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm sorry for having uh, interrupted you. And uh, now I would ask uh, Professor uh, Martin to uh, take on uh, and to please make his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marc Olivier. Um, so what I'll do is um, something quite different. I'll give you a, a short update on uh, uh, the economic situation and some of the uh, economic debates that we have right now in the crisis in, in France, which I think maybe of importance for, for the, the campaign that is, uh, is going to come. So clearly in the beginning of the crisis, uh, France was uh, hit very hard, both on the health and the, on the economic dimension. Um, if you think of, uh, I mean, in, in economics, we like a uh, misery index. And one misery index could be the, the sum of basically uh, the death and, and, and GDP form during the crisis. And uh, what we've seen during that period is that indeed France was not doing well uh, compared to many other countries, uh, at least at the beginning, basically on the, the first and second semester of 2020 uh, compared to other European countries. And that I think is going to count during the, 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 the campaign uh, in terms of how we judge the management of the, of the crisis. However, um, there's also some positive signs. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, France is doing relatively better than other countries. As you know, in this country, in this, uh, in this crisis, crisis, we all compare to each other. Uh, and in, uh, in the beginning of that year, this year, at least uh, things are, are, are doing a little bit better, at least from an economic point of view. Uh, so during the crisis, it's, uh, it's 
still true that there was a very, very strong answer from, uh, from an economic point of view and in terms of protection of both households and, and firms, uh, but especially households. And if you look at the average income uh, in France of households, it has been very well preserved. You have had massive transfers. And in fact, it has, uh, in, like in many other countries, generated a massive budget deficit. Um, and, and, and this is important because, and this is compared also, I mean, relative to, to what Cecile was talking about, uh, Macron is somebody who um, still reinvented himself in this crisis in the sense that indeed, uh, I agree with the, um, the, the, the importance of the startup model, but clearly during the crisis, he has also uh, shifted to a model where uh, which is much more uh, interventionist, which gives a, a very strong role to, to, uh, to, to the state and, and which has translated like in many other countries, but in France very strongly because of the welfare state, of course, uh, as, uh, with, a, with a massive budget deficit. Uh, now it's true that the stimulus is not as large as in the US and we may come back to, uh, to, to this debate. In fact, this is a lively debate right now in France and I'll say a word on it. Uh, but still, uh, uh, very strong intervention, and this was not completely obvious huh, from uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from Macron point of view. However, there are still some uh, issues in terms of protection of, of uh, households uh, and the, uh, the issue of inequality, which has uh, risen as a as a big issue during the Macron presidency. I think is going to come back if you look at. Uh, uh, for example, the, the saving which has been accumulated by the, 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 the households in the crisis, it's very strongly concentrated among the, the top decides of income. 70% uh, of the saving has been done by the top 20% and the bottom 20% has have basically not accumulated any, any savings. So there's still some inequality issue and especially among the young uh, who have lost in terms of income. Uh, and financial precarity, even though it has not the, uh, uh, increased among the average population, has actually increased uh, uh, among, among the young. Um, for the firms, um, so they have been quite well protected, um, but the big issue is going to be the issue of uh, potential failures. Actually, the paradox is that in 2020, the number of failures of, uh, of firm failures in France has, has decreased relative to 2019 because of the huge uh, uh, state support. Uh, but the issue in the next uh, few months, and this is particularly important, of course, in a year of uh, an electoral campaign, is uh, basically how uh, fast we're going to uh, uh, reduce the, the public support to, 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 to firms. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, my guess is that this is not during a political uh, campaign that uh, you reduce pu uh, public support to households, to firms. So the, the, the whatever it costs, I think is going to continue uh, at least until, uh, until the end of the, uh, the presidential uh, camp campaign. Um, so indeed, uh, the, the one, one question now, and this is a question, uh, one debate uh, is um, whether we, sh we should have more stimulus. Uh, and here, clearly, uh, the impact of the Biden uh, uh, announcements uh, and presidency are, are very important in, in France um, uh, in, in many dimensions. Uh, so, so there is a debate, in fact, inside the executive among those who say that uh, um, the issue now is going to be public debt uh, and that we should uh, uh, relatively quickly stop uh, uh, the, uh, the, the spending and the whatever it takes. And those, and I think the president is more on that side, who say that we need to, uh, to go from uh, public intervention uh, that is mostly protection of firms and households to one that is uh, uh, towards reallocation and structural reforms. One should never forget that uh, Macron is somebody indeed who, who really thinks of himself as a big reformer. He's not that interested by the management of the economic crisis per se. And in a sense, I think this is a bit of a problem because the transition uh, out of the crisis is, is, is extremely important uh, and, and structural reforms is, is, is clearly obsessed and for many good reasons huh, uh, with structural reforms. But I think that the, 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 the key issues in the next few months is 
to what extent this economic crisis is going to leave some permanent or at least persistent scars, uh, both from a social point of view and economic point of view. And I think this is something which is going to be extremely important in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, next, uh, in the next campaign. Um, now, um, uh, the, the one, one question, of course, from an economic point of view is to what extent uh, the, the economic crisis uh, or the recession will be behind us by, by the election time. And uh, uh, in some sense, I think that in terms of growth, we can expect at least if there's not a rebound of the, 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 the health crisis, that growth will be high, but unemployment also will be high. Um, what matters for unemployment is not uh, growth itself, but the level of activity uh, relative to, in some sense, the normal level. And from that point of view, uh, we may fear that unemployment will uh, will increase in the in the in the next uh, six months. And there's uh, uh, the big issue in France, which for which actually, and we may uh, come back on this on this uh, later on, is that uh, when unemployment increases in France, it's extremely difficult uh, to reduce it. It takes a very long time, uh, and this is called in, in economics what we call it an hysteresis uh, phen phenomenon, where uh, uh, when there's a rise of unemployment, but then it takes a very long time to, 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 to decrease it. And so unemployment, I think, is going to be a key issue also because uh, in France, um, the decision to invest, to, to save, uh, depends very much on, on, on the prospects in terms of the, the labor market. So I've actually recommended that uh, all the efforts should be done to, to have a quick uh, um, uh, growth, uh, a, a very strong growth in terms of uh, uh, hiring and helping in terms of hiring. One, uh, one thing that is uh, not clear is to what extent, I alluded to that, to what extent the issue of public debt is going to be part of the, the campaign. Uh, in a sense, we are in a very strange world where for many, many years in the political debates, we said debt is bad, but still we were accumulating it. Uh, and now um, uh, you have uh, a part of, I think, of the electorate, the French electorate, is, uh, uh, is, um, does not understand what happens. And in the sense, I, 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 uh, I understand why they don't understand, because uh, indeed, uh, uh, it looks as if we can spend as much as we want. Uh, and, and so it's a very difficult uh, political uh, uh, situation from that point of view to explain that, yes, we can spend a lot in the, in the short term, but that uh, still means that uh, we have to be careful in terms of, of, of permanent spending. Um, now, another question, which economic or social question, which is going to be, I think, important during, uh, during the campaign is the issue of inequality, which has been revived during the, uh, uh, during the, the, the crisis. And as was alluded uh, uh, by, by Cecile, this was an important issue, of course, during the Gilets jaunes crisis. I think Macron on this has not uh, changed that much uh, in the sense that he thinks that the big issue in terms of inequalities in France is not, uh, is not going to be solved by more fiscal transfers uh, from the rich to, to the poor, because we have uh, already a lot of transfers in, in, in France. And that's, from that point of view, quite different from uh, the American situation. He really thinks that the, uh, the, the issue of inequalities has to be solved at, at the source of the inequalities, uh, and in particular in terms of uh, territories, in terms of inequalities, uh, to, uh, in terms of access to education and uh, uh, to, to employment. And the first source of inequality in France is actually an unemployment. And that is, uh, is, is clearly uh, behind his, uh, all his actions on, on, on these issues. Um, now, uh, to, to end on this, I think that uh, the paradox is that if, um, if, uh, if the management of the economic crisis is behind us uh, uh, during, at the end, uh, um, or during the, the, the electoral campaign, then that means that I think this increases, in a sense, the, the probability that uh, Le Pen may win. And, and the reason is that I think at the end, what will matter very much is whether uh, the French uh, uh, will have a, a sentiment of fear or a sentiment of anger uh, with this crisis in particular. 
uh, if there is more fear, I think that they will want competency. Uh, and still, uh, if you compare uh, Le Pen and Macron, I think the, 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 the answer is, is very clear. They will go for, for Macron. Um, but if there's no more fear in terms of economics, in terms of health, then I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, there's a high probability that uh, Le Pen wins, but clearly there is still a lot of anger in the French society. Um, from a social, from an economic point of view, there's, uh, uh, there, this, the, this crisis, this political crisis has not been solved uh, by, by Macron uh, from that point of view. And if there is a lot of anger and less fear, I think that raises clearly the probability that uh, Le Pen wins. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin, with this, uh, uh, well, worrying ending, but a very interesting presentation. I will, uh, let's now move on to Ambassador uh, Aro, uh, and please. Uh, Thank you, Marc Olivier. And again, it's great to be with you. And uh, before going to my uh, foreign policy field, I, I want simply to, to say that when I was, when I, I saw when I was ambassador to Washington and when, when Trump won, uh, afterwards, what was fascinating for me, of course, was to really to conclude that all Western democracies uh, were facing the same crisis, more or less, with national circumstances, of course, and that so for the American audience, in a sense, uh, you have also to think of the French uh, political social crisis to which Philippe was referring just before as comparable to the American political and, and social crisis uh, with the same shift of some of our citizens uh, to, the far, uh, to, the, to the far right. As for the foreign policy and uh, thinking of the 2022 election, I could be very short because in a sense, like in any Western democracies, uh, foreign policy uh, will play a secondary, a secondary role uh, uh, in the, the next uh, presidential campaign. Uh, of course, there will be 10 minutes at the end of the presidential debates, which will be dedicated by uh, the poor journalists to foreign policy but I don't see why in 2022 it would be more significant than it was uh, in, in 2017. So people will talk of China, but it will, they will talk of China not in terms of political or foreign policy, but because of, of the trade, because of uh, protecting the French jobs. Uh, and so it will be very, very peripheral. Uh, the issue, uh, of course, which is, on a sense as foreign policy that it is a domestic policy uh, will be as usual in the center of European election, the question of the, of the European Union. And as you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron was elected as the most pro-European candidate by far uh, in 2017. And he has tried all over the last four years he has tried to prove uh, first to reform, to reform the European Union and to prove to the French citizens that the European Union could respond to their, uh, their concerns and their, and their worries. And it happens that by chance, France will have the presidency of the European Union during the first six months of 2022. Of course, the, uh, the presidency of the European Union is much less important than it was uh, before the Treaty of Lisbon, but nevertheless, it will offer a lot of opportunities, uh, including uh, 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 to, to go to what Cecile said, theatrical uh, opportunities. It will offer a lot of opportunities to Emmanuel Macron to show that the EU matters and to show that France matters uh, within the EU. Uh, the junior minister for, for European affairs who is very uh, talented and very active has already set uh, the main, uh, the, the, the program of the French presidency. And as if it is by chance, it's precisely trying to respond uh, to uh, the political debate uh, going on in France in terms of the borders of the European Union, really uh, for against immigration, but also the protection of uh, the social, the European social model, uh, the identity of Europe. So that will be on the Emmanuel Macron that, of course, that will be one of his important part of, of, of the campaign. 
There will be also that maybe um, eventually uh, Europe will be uh, dispersing uh, its uh, really stimulus program, you know, which has been agreed. And again, it has been agreed, which was a real breakthrough uh, in the European Union, because it's the first time that the European Union is going to, to, uh, to, to borrow money on, on its own name. And uh, so there will be the 750 billion euros. Uh, I suppose that it will be uh, disbursed. It will start to be disbursed because European Union is the slowest, most pedestrian institution I know. So I guess it will be disbursed in the coming months. So it will be an argument also for Emmanuel Macron to say that thanks to, to, to him, uh, the European Union is acting, uh, is acting. So that will be, I, I, I suppose, that will be uh, an important part of the, the foreign policy agenda in the sense of Emmanuel Macron. But uh, uh, it won't be easy, actually, to sell. Uh, he has been successful in mobilizing in 2017 the pro-European uh, voters behind him, but it won't be easy, it won't be, uh, easy this time. First, as you know, uh, the anti-globalization movement uh, in a sense is targeting Washington DC and Wall Street in the US while uh, Brussels is be has become the symbol of globalization uh, and in this sense is really uh, the target of a lot of criticism coming from the, uh, from, coming from the left and coming from, from, from the far right. Another point, uh, which, and again, here I am uh, really uh, following what Philip said, uh, it will be in the sanitary field, on the sanitary field, what will be the assessment of the voters of the EU performance uh, uh, in May? You know, if there were the election had been um, conducted, if there was the election three, four, or five months ago, it would have been disastrous for the European Union, and I suppose for the candidate uh, waving the flag of the European Union, uh, because the vaccination process was seen as a total fiasco of the European Union. Things are, are improving slowly, and I think, uh, and uh, so what will be the conclusion of the voters in May 2022? Uh, I don't know. You know, really, look at what is happening in the U United Kingdom. Uh, the, the performance of the government against uh, the, uh, the COVID against was certainly one of the worst in Europe, you know, and the number of fat fatalities is, uh, is really a, a good evidence of that. But because of the success of the vaccination process, apparently the British are forgiving their government uh, for that. So. We, we, we will see. Another reason uh, which could make difficult the European Union um, flag on, the, on, on Macron's side is simply because Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, has uh, uh, really moderated very much her attitude uh, versus the European Union. In 2017, basically, uh, at least till the, the presidential debate, uh, uh, she was advocating leaving the Euro and, and more or less, uh, she was uh, opening the, 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 the hypothesis of leaving the European Union. This time, it's over, over. She has understood that, especially the, 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 the older voters are really committed to the European Union. They, are, they were frightened by the idea of leaving the Euro. And, and she is very, very discreet, very, very prudent on these issues. She's vaguely referring to the idea of reforming uh, uh, the European Union. Uh, so I, I suppose that it means that it will be uh, less, a contentious, uh, uh, less a contentious issue, at least between the far right and, and Emmanuel Macron. Last point. Uh, which is, of course, the election of, of Joe Biden in the US. Um, Joe Biden has been president for only four months. And uh, in a sense, the COVID has, has paralyzed uh, and uh, uh, marginalized foreign, issue, foreign affairs issue, uh, at least partly. But the fact is that you can find a lot of commonalities between uh, the uh, Joe, Biden's, uh, Joe Biden's policy in, uh, in terms of uh, taxation of high tech companies or minimum taxation of, of companies in fighting the, the, the fighting the climate change, uh, 
uh, really in a cell, really in summary thought by using the, an expression of Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, uh, really a foreign policy for, for, for the middle class. So I don't know uh, if, uh, if uh, Emmanuel Macron will uh, really use this opportunity uh, in the coming months uh, to send the message that he's working on this progressive international agenda with, with Joe Biden. Uh, it could be the case, and he has another opportunity, which is given by the fact that in Germany, uh, Germany is entering uh, a process of a transition from Angela Merkel to her successor. And it's a long, complicated uh, uh, process, uh, which means that Germany, which has not and ever been very active on the international scene, but will be still less present on, on the international stage, uh, which could offer another opportunity, uh, talking in the in the Cecile's terms, uh, to be uh, to be on the on the front stage, to be in a, uh, on the front stage in the coming months. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, I'm now we're going to begin the Q and A session. Please feel free to. Uh, uh, pose your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, for the first question, I'm going to turn to Marc Olivier, who will uh, uh, question the panelists on their presentations. Marc Olivier. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Um, my first question would be, um, what, what do you think is uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, signature uh, um, decision as a president? Um, you, uh, Professor Mar Martin, you presented him as a, a president who wanted to be a, a big re reformer, but he has ended being maybe more of a manager because of the circumstances of uh, the uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, but still, like if it was to uh, to campaign on what he has done uh, during the last few years, what do you think is his, his main achievement uh, in terms of? Um, political uh, uh economic policy of course mr uh, professor martin uh on the and uh monsieur Aho, ambassador Aho, on the um on the on the on the foreign uh, um uh, affair uh, uh level thank you um well, indeed, the, the, the problem is that Macron uh, was su supposed to be a, a, a reformer and indeed the, the events, uh, and not only the COVID crisis, but uh, also the Gilets jaunes crisis, uh, made him more a manager of crisis uh, than a reformer. On the, on the, uh, the big reform uh, was, uh, was uh, the, uh, the pension reform. And just before the, the crisis, the, the pension reform was in disarray. Uh, now it's basically comatose, and uh, some try to resuscitate, resuscitate it, but uh, I think it's going to be a very difficult issue. Although I do think that uh, uh, during the campaign, uh, the question of what to do with uh, with pensions in in France is going to uh, is going to come back, and the debate on whether you do a, a reform that simply uh, raises the, the the age of pension or you're trying to do a structural reform which is maybe more progressive, is going to come back. I think he will have to choose between the two. He tried as many times, he's tried to put it together, uh, something which is both in some sense quite uh, conservative, rising the, the pension age and, and more progressive. He tried to put them together and this did not work. So I think he will have to choose. Um, on the other reforms, well, he had there, there were some reforms at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of his mandate on the labor market, uh, on, on training, um, uh, also a bit in, uh, in education. But for example, but, but clearly, very quickly, uh, uh, with in particular the Gilets jaunes crisis, these reforms uh, uh, stopped. Uh, He's still, uh, um, uh, for example, trying to, to push uh, some reforms. So, for example, right now, uh, one big reform uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is pushed is on the labor market, on the unemployment insurance uh, system. So he's, he's very eager huh, to, to, to keep on, 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 on reforming. But clearly, uh, his mandate has been, in some sense, impeached uh, uh, on, on, and, and less ambitious 
that certainly he, he wanted. Ambassador uh, Arrow, and on the, the, the foreign, uh, on the international stage, what was the signature move by, by um, uh, Macron, uh, and even to let's, let's say to uh, restore France's prestige uh, uh, around the world and at home? Oh, it's not a question. Foreign policy is not a question of restoring prestige. It's a question of defending interest. No, uh, I think he has also, you know, um, success is, also, is based on talent and on luck. And uh, he has not been lucky, right? let's be frank. I will um, really, not only because of the COVID, but also because simply Donald Trump was elected president. And it's very difficult to have an active foreign policy for a country like France. Uh, when you have such a, a real disruptive, uh, the first, the, the main power is, is mainly disruptive and, and especially against what is at the core of European foreign policy, which is multilateralism, international, uh, international cooperation. In a sense, France was let alone uh, facing challenges and, and here France has met the limitations of its, of its power. Uh, without uh, the support of, of, of the United States, it, it was, of course, uh, complicated, difficult, and nearly impossible uh, in some, in some uh, crisis uh, to, 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 to solve the, the, the crisis. No, for me, uh, what will remain for, from the, uh, the, the, these this five years, uh, at least I believe he will campaign on that, will be uh, certainly the 750 billion euros, the first time that Europe has really is engaged into uh, a, a sort of common, uh, a common debt. And that will be, and of, of course, uh, facing, uh, facing uh, the major economic crisis. I think it will, you know, the challenge, as I have said, is to show to the French citizens that EU is relevant for them in their life. It's, it's very comparable to what the Biden administration is doing by saying we are a foreign policy to the middle class. You know, really in every field, uh, when, when we are facing the populism, we have to show to our citizens that what we are doing, domestic, politic, economic, social, actually is relevant uh, to, to the citizen. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I may I'm... just uh, add to, to what um, uh, Ambassador Aho just said, which I think is right on, 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 on the topic is, you know, Marco Lidia, you, you presented your answer, what is the signature of Macron's policy? And then you added that he will want to claim for the next presidential campaign. I think most French citizens would say that the signature of Macron policies was the suppression of the solidarity tax on wealth at the very beginning of his mandate. And it was supposed to be one reform that would be followed by others going in the opposite direction to give back purchasing power to the middle class. But for various reasons, that, that second stage of reform that would benefit the middle class did not really happen. And we had the yellow jacket to kind of prove it and, and stall any other kind of a reform that would have day-to-day um, -day consequences. And so the, and this comes back to Philippe Martin's conclusion about Marine Le Pen's chances for the re-election, for, for her election next time, is that um, he ran on optimism. You spoke about feelings, anger, or fear, and Macron ran on optimism. And this optimism has been, you know, uh, put uh, a stop by different crises. Uh, the retirement reform was one of them. COVID was one of them, the yellow vest as well. And what kind of emotion is going to be uh, the next one Macron tries to lead with when the promises of reform that would benefit um, lower or middle classes have not come to fruition. So another way to turn the question would be what he has not done that could haunt him uh, during the next presidential campaign. Um, rather than what he did that he could campaign with. And, and that would be a different question. Thank you. Uh, my question is in the first instance for Cécile Aldoui, uh, but I'd also like to hear the views of the other two panelists. Uh, Philippe Martin alluded to the possibility that Marine Le Pen might indeed win. 
The uh, latest Harris poll shows Macron winning in the second round, but only by 54 to 46. So Marine Le Pen has considerably increased her vote since her 34% performance in the second round in 2017. Now, much commentary in France is focused on the fact that uh, Macron seems to be shifting his policy to poach voters from the far right. He's taking a harder stance on what he calls Islamist separatism, uh, emphasizing law enforcement security, uh, and uh, taking a tough line on immigration. What is less remarked upon is the fact that Marine Le Pen seems to be emulating Macron in certain ways. Uh, Macron, uh, as uh, uh, Philippe Martin pointed out, uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, emphasized entrepreneurship, the startup nation. In her recent speech, in her May Day speech, the traditional May Day speech of the Front National, uh, she appeared alongside uh, Jordan Bardella, her young and charismatic uh, second in command, uh, and gave a speech about the importance of entrepreneurship, offered to invest, to match any investment funds by entrepreneurs under 30 years old with state funds, uh, to exempt uh, taxes uh, uh, on the income from such investments for five, a period of five years, in a clear appeal to young people. Uh, at the same time, uh, she's uh, brought uh, uh, Sebastian Chenu into her government uh, after dismissing Florian Philippot, her previous te technocratic advisor. Philippot was an intellectual and enoch, but uh, had no government experience. Chenu is different. He, has, uh, he worked in the cabinet of Christine Lagarde uh, and has actual governing experience. So she shored up her credentials as someone who could potentially govern the country. And these moves seem to have had a positive effect. So uh, what do you make of this change in strategy? Is it simply a continuation of the, the demonization strategy that has characterized her policy for the past 10 years? Or is this really a new shift? Has she gone in a new direction? And is she becoming a more credible uh, person to govern France uh, than she was in 2017? Thank you for the great pointers uh, in your question. Indeed, I noticed the, um, uh, the, the, next, the last um, move to try to seduce young entrepreneurs with um, you know, tax reliefs uh, for their investments. I think that it's actually a continuation of what she started to do in, 20, in preparation for the 2017 presidential campaign where she had created a think tank called Racine to look at uh, culture, another one to look at companies and investments. And she had tried to rally people from the business world and um, the higher administration. At the time though, there was still a um, much stronger taboo on joining the National Front, which was, it was the name at the, at the time. And these people uh, were kept anonymous. And so she could not really flaunt them by her side the way she's doing now. Uh, with a number of new uh, wins, so to speak. Uh, one has to remember that at uh, the second debate in the 2017 presidential election, um, it was a disaster for Marine Le Pen specifically on her cred credibility on, on uh, economic questions. She was grilled by Macron and the journalists and could not um, answer questions uh, that would show uh, her legitimacy to run a 66 million country. Um, and so right after that, in the polls, her image suffered tremendously. She lost support from her own base. She lost 20% um, in the polls on, on the criteria of uh, credibility to govern. And so she has patiently tried to restore her image and the movement to uh, moderate her discourse on Europe, which was considered one of the flaws of her past program that would um, basically frighten uh, the electorate, especially people who are older and um, depend on their pension plans in Euro to continue to live or small um, uh, shopkeepers and small businesses who do not want to change to, to, change to a new currency uh, tomorrow. She uh, dismissed that and she dismissed Filippo, uh, who is a strong believer in uh, leaving the EU at the same time. 
The question for Marine Le Pen in terms of credibility is how much she she has to juggle two things. She needs to still be radical enough that she's attractive as an anti-system populist. And so the more she moderates her discourse, the more she's she she could potentially fall into Ma Macron's plan to make her less um, uh, in sense, uh, incisive, less appealing uh, by portraying his own uh, government I stronger on security as harsher on immigration. Uh, the Minister of Interior, Gérald Damanin, has tweeted recently that they have reduced by 30% uh, the number of um, illegal um, immigrants and um, the um, renewal of uh, carte de séjour. So there is this agenda to look as strong as what the National Front, the National Rassemblement would be in power. And so Marine Le Pen has to be radical enough to offer a contrast to what Macron has been. And so this is a tricky position because on the one hand, she wants to enlarge her base to, to tap into all the electoral uh, segments, including the higher ups, including the entrepreneurs, including people who are about to retire or retired. But to do so, the, she has to moderate or neoliberalize her discourse and, and uh, the risk is to sound too much like the old class. Uh, at the same time, Macron runs the same risk of looking uh, spineless by running after where the voters go, which is currently to the right, according to the polls, and then losing the other side of his electorate. Um, so I think that because of um, how Marine Le Pen is positioning herself as the only opponent to Macron, she will have at some point in the campaign to reassert her key pet issues, such as anti-immigration, um, national identity, national preference, and that might uh, give less importance to the measure in favor of entrepreneurship that you've just mentioned. Okay, would uh, either uh, Monsieur Martin or Monsieur Aho like to comment on? I, I know issues? only a remark, you know, really, uh, let's not forget that according to recent polls, you know, polls really are worth what they are worth. Uh, uh, right now on 100 French, 25 are saying they're on the left, 20 are saying that they don't know, and 55 say they are on the right. So it means that uh, Emmanuel Macron, you know, is reading the polls and which explain, you know, this morning, uh, this very morning in Paris, um, Michel Barnier, you know, the negotiator of Brexit has made an incredibly <laughs> rightist declaration about immigration that I would have never expected from somebody like Michel Barnier. So I think our politicians, like any politician in any uh, country, are, have decided, have concluded that the election will be will, will be won on the right. Thank you. Uh, would any of my co-chairs like to? Uh, Can I just add, uh, add, add uh, one thing? Um, on, me. I agree. There's clearly a, a conservative shift of the, the electorate. It's still true that Macron uh, will need in the second round uh, that some uh, uh, yes. some people from the left vote for him. And I think there's a bit of a free rider problem here in the sense that, uh, uh, and it's maybe only anecdotal, but I see many uh, people on the left who say, of course, they prefer Macron to Le Pen, but I basically expect the others to go and vote for, uh, for, for Macron and I won't do it. So I think there is a risk and I don't want to, to, to overstate it, but I do think there's a risk at some point that there's an accident in the sense that uh, everybody expects the others to go and, and vote for Macron. They don't want to do it, but they still they would still obviously hate uh, the idea that Le Pen uh, is elected. But at the end, that not enough people uh, 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 go to the polls and, and vote against uh, Le Pen. I still think this is a high risk. That's a very important point. Very, very important. Yes, the abstention yeah. of the left. Yeah. 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 Uh, would any of my co-chairs like to uh, intervene at this point? Well, if, if I could pick up on that, that last point, I mean, you know, obviously since 2002, the second tour, 
had, uh, has not been kind to the Le Pen family. And so a lot of this discourse of you know, uh, shifting to the right or appealing to fear was also uh, the case with the Sarkozy election. So, I mean, th there is some sense of, of a long cycle, at least since 2002, if not before, the second tour has not been kind to the Le Pen family. And so do you all see the, the coming to an end of a long cycle? Um, there are obviously local dynamics this year, but you know, there's, there's in, to what extent does the second tour provide kind of an institutional check that favors the incumbent and to what extent do change in circumstances, you know, the populism, Brexit, Trump, et cetera, is this a different historical moment that will uh, uh, call into question that institutional stopgap of the second tour that favors the incumbent? There is also the fact, if you allow me, and, but I let the real specialist uh, answer the question. There is also the element of the fatigue of the left which has been called, you know, which has been called to vote for the right wing candidate for the last three elections. Really, what we call the Republican Front, really basically voting against the far right, maybe used or invoked once, twice, but really the third time, you know, it's becoming a lot. And a lot of my leftist friends are telling me, you know, we are not supposed only to elect right wing candidates over is over, and especially if Macron, which is the case right now, is shifting himself to the right. Yes, and um, so we're putting a lot of emphasis on, on left-leaning uh, voters and what they might do in the second round. And it's true that there is a, a disillusionment and tiredness about you know, being the safeguard of democracy when then the policy that is implemented and the discourse, which is more troubling, I think, is not that different than what you know Francois Fillon would have done, or and now on security and immigration, some of Macron's ministers have been to the right of Marine Le Pen in some instances, and uh, and and uh, Darmanin said Marine Le Pen was too soft on immigration, which is kind of uh, an interesting thing to hear <laughs> in your lifetime. But there's another phenomenon, which is um, the uh, voters who used to affiliate with the Republican Party, the French Republican Party to the, the right, who are more and more comfortable voting for Marine Le Pen. And so the most traveling opinion poll actually is that if a leader from um, the left was in the second round, that's probably not gonna happen, then Marine Le Pen has a chance to be elected with very little problem because the right would prefer Marine Le Pen to a Green Party candidate, to the mayor of Paris, uh, Hidalgo, uh, of course, to Jean-Luc Mélenchon on the far left. So the porosity between um, the electorate of the National Front and the Republican Party, and to a certain extent, the République En Marche has increased in, in the cycle that you referred to, to really high point at this, as, at this time. Uh, which can be seen in the south of France and has been seen in the south of France for a long time. So that's even more troubling because this is where um, the, the um, stopgap of the second round will not work any longer, is already not working. Um, so this is a, a, real, uh, a real possibility here. Okay. If I could just uh, jump in here quickly, um, one of the things that's been very interesting about this whole campaign so far has been the extent to which Marine Le Pen has appealed very directly to youths, and the polls are suggesting strong support on the part of younger voters uh, for her. And I just wonder, what, what is Macron doing uh, to, to counter this? Is he doing anything? What is the weight of the youth vote? Um, how do you see this? So vote, young voters don't vote much. So that's one of the issue um, that um, is impacting uh, the results of elections in general. They're much less likely to go to vote than the older generations. Um, Marine Le Pen is extremely strong as the, the, her party is the first in the 25 to 34 year old group. Uh, and that's because also she was uh, that, that strong five years ago in the 18 to 24 who now are the other age group. And so that, that tells you about, you know, young people who want to start a family and have difficulties doing so and are confronted to the harsh realities of entering the job market, um, credit debt, and, and so on. The youth is actually more leaning slightly more to Macron currently, but it might change next year. Uh, the COVID crisis has been tremendously impactful on the youth. 
And not only is it affecting the youth themselves uh, who are going to food bank to survive, who are affected psychologically, financially in, in tremendous ways, but to their families and to their grandparents' generation as well who witnessed that. So there's an image issue for Macron about how he handled uh, the youth uh, during the COVID crisis. My suspicion is that he's going to propose what he has been opposing for a long time, which is the minimum minimum um, income for the youth uh, in, in the coming month to try to um, seduce again um, that electorate. I don't know if it will be enough though. Uh, thank you. Uh, time is getting short and we have a long list of questions from the uh, general audience. So uh, I'm gonna select two uh, and see uh, how far we get in answering them. First is from uh, Harvey Feigenbaum of George Washington University, uh, who says, uh, I don't think uh, La République en Marche is either a party or a movement. It is a fan club. Macron is a populist in form, a conservative in content. So a statement, not a question, but uh, uh, I'd like you to respond to that. And then a second question from Igor Popadrashkov, which is a very long question, but I'll uh, cut to, to the end of it, which is about Russian influence in the French election. We know that uh, Russian banks lent to Marine Le Pen in the last election. Uh, Russia has been active in uh, uh, social media in the United States, as well as in France. It tried to subvert uh, Macron's campaign in 2017. What uh, about Russian influence in 2022? And uh, I throw that to the panel. Whoever would like to go first uh, can have the floor. Well, I think that Russian influence is anecdotal. You know, really uh, uh, the same way that he did. It's not Russia which elected Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, Russia will elect nobody uh, in, the, in, the, in France. Uh, they have tried uh, in France, like in any European country, to help the far right, to help them uh, through uh, social media. They have their own uh, TV uh, channel, uh, RT. Uh, they have Sputnik <laughs> News, and uh, and traditionally, the uh, you know the far right loves uh, Putin. But frankly, it's it's very very marginal. It won't play any significant role. Okay. So on the uh, the first question, um, it was kind of my uh, presentation, actually, so I could not agree more, except that it was specifically true, I think, in 2017, that um, Macron adopted this populist discourse against the elite. Uh, he uh, lambasted the system. And I think the form of his discourse was, was attracted a lot of voters. That is, a, a, a radical change, a renewal of the political... Uh, personnel, uh, doing things differently, uh, shaking up the establishment, even though, of course, he was Minister of the Economy just a year before. Um, and the conservative content is, is what it has become in action uh, through uh, its economic and fiscal policy. Uh, to be fair, there, there have been measures uh, that are leaning more towards the traditional left, but they've been eclipsed by the controversies around the fiscal measures at the beginning of the mandate. And so again, this is where, I mean, there's already um, a platform being put um, out on the web by uh, the Elysee Palace to establish all the things that have been done, you know, measure by measure and compare that to the promises of 2017. And there are sometimes really micro measures such as the right to error. So you can forget your taxes once, for instance, and um, the idea is to reestablish uh, a record that is more balanced than the public image is at the current moment. Okay, thank you. Can I respond on, 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 on this comment? So yes. I, I think it's still a bit more um, uh, complex than this. Um, I, I don't see Macron as a, as a populist. Uh, frankly, if you look at his electorate, his electorate is not at all the electorate of a populist. Uh, they are highly educated. Um, so so I, I think that's a bit uh, too far to go. Uh, conservative, yes, on some issues, and it's clear that he's, he's shifted towards uh, conservative positions. 
still, and, and, and Cécile alluded to this, um, uh, I, I, I think, and there were some, some uh, um, uh, reforms uh, that were clearly progressive. Huh? Uh, one, strangely, it's true that they are not in the debate, but uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the subsidies to low wage workers were, were increased quite uh, strongly. Uh, there was uh, a reform on the education in uh, for for uh, 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 for in, in particular in, in parts of France, uh, which uh, have a lot of uh, uh, low education uh, uh, persons, where basically the size of classes were reduced uh, by half. Uh, so so there were some some reforms. It's true that they were at the beginning and or in response to uh, the uh, gilets jaune crisis. But I think it's a bit uh, too, uh, and in a sense, uh, that's the complexity of, of Macron is that uh, is, is a bit more complex than a simple conservative. And frankly, a populist, yes, indeed in 2017, in style, there were some, uh, some parts, but he's seen today and is criticized as somebody who is an elitist. Uh, so very differently, from, uh, from, from populism. So I think it's a much uh, more complex story than that. I, I totally agree that the populist label is for the form only of the 2017 discourse and that being in power by Biden itself, uh, you know, and embracing the presidency and its symbolism uh, puts him totally at odds with the populist discourse at the moment. And on top of it is a pro-European, which is clearly not, uh, not at, at all uh, uh, consistent with populist uh, uh, situation. Okay, uh, we have uh, two more minutes left. So time for one more question from uh, Tony Jones. To what extent will Mediterranean instability and related refugee migration be an issue for the election? It seems as if the Mediterranean has disappeared from public discourse in Europe in general. Is this true also for the French? No, I, you know, on these issues, uh, as I have said, um, foreign policy issues could be peripheral to another general issue. And I think that there could be uh, really talks or discussions or debates about the Mediterranean because of immigration. You know, the issue will be uh, uh, immigration. And of course, there will be the question of the poor people crossing the Mediterranean Sea, risking their life, dying. And, and of course, with very different elements on both sides of the political spectrum. So that's, uh, I think it will be in the framework of the immigration debate. There is a question, and I don't know whether Macron will announce or make some move, which is the French involvement in the Sahel region. Uh, you know, I have written myself that it's, in a sense, it's our Afghanistan. Uh, we have been there for uh, eight years and it will be nine years without any prospect of quote unquote victory. Uh, so, and Macron, when he was elected has tried, you know, to extricate ourselves from the crisis by relying on the local forces, it didn't work. So whether he will make announcement on this issue, uh, which to be frank is not on the front burner in the French public opinion, we have lost uh, 60 soldiers, uh, really, um, but he could uh, really raise, he could raise the issue, he's disruptive, uh, as you know, and he may conclude that uh, he can't simply accept five years more of, of uh, military involvement in the Sahel region. As for Turkey, Turkey is the bad guy of French uh, politics, and in a sense, uh, Macron can claim uh, that uh, last summer, he has been uh, on the side of Greece and Cyprus uh, against, against, uh, against Turkey. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm afraid we're out of time. So it's my uh, duty to thank all the panelists for a stimulating discussion. I also want to thank the CES staff, uh, Laura, Michael, Vasilis, uh, uh, for uh, facilitating this uh, session. And uh, particularly to thank Marc-Olivier Berger, our Neiman Fellow, who has uh, uh, really been the organizing force behind this. Uh, Marc Olivier, would you like to say a final word before we close out? Um, well, I just want to, to thank everybody for, for, for the opportunity. And I was uh, really glad that we uh, had such uh, esteemed guests uh, and such an interesting uh, discussion. I think it's a very uh, important election. We're going uh, to uh, 
to be uh, aiming for going for so it is very important that uh, we try to make sense of it and try to understand it and so i, I want to thank you uh, everybody at the ces for making uh, this uh, discussion possible and thank you again professor Adji, martin and uh, ambassador Aho. thank you all uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much.